work at Mayo Clinic. I think the one-liner for me is I'm a Medicare age hematologist accepting new patients. <laughs> All right. All right. So uh, Dr. McLean just uh, mentioned the host of signs and symptoms and organs that can be involved by ECD. Uh, this is a pictorial, a, a diagram showing all of those. And I have to thank my uh, uh, colleague here, Dr. Gaurav Goyal, who's now at UAB. He, uh, we put together this paper some years ago. Um, but as you can see, you know, patients with ECD can have signs and symptoms, uh, I, I would say minimal sign, minimal symptoms, uh, you know, ranging from skin findings that may not be painful or having any issues, the patient, or bone findings that may not be tender or painful. Uh, this can also, uh, the other side of the spectrum is more critical organ involvement. So for example, brain involvement with movement problem, falls, uh, difficulty uh, talking and swallowing uh, to cardiac uh, uh, involvement or big blood vessels, what we call vasculitis. Um, and so not every patient has the same signs or symptoms. And so this is important because I'm tasked to uh, task with uh, discussing the treatment. So the first question, whenever we see patients with ECD, uh, after the diagnosis is established is to, to ask the question, at least I do this uh, for every patient, is do you need treatment? And, uh, and you know where the answer is going. It's of course, it's not, uh, not everybody needs therapy. So if the patient is not symptomatic and the involved uh, organ or site is not a critical organ, so for example, rashes, uh, bone without any symptom, major symptoms, or even sometimes just the hairy kidneys without any kidney function abnormality, then one can be observed. And in fact, if you think about it, many of our patients who are not so symptomatic, incidentally found or minimally symptomatic, if you go back to their imaging and their history, they have the condition for years in a way that they've been observed for many years. So observation is certainly a valid uh, management uh, for some patients. Certainly you want to follow them over time to see if there's any progression. You got to be, uh, you got to listen to our, to, we have to listen to our patients to see what kinds of signs and symptoms they develop over time. Of course, if the patient is symptomatic, um, we, we need to treat. Now, uh, the treatment also depends um, there are situations where in the involvement is, say, the pituitary gland, you know, that's the middle of the brain, and where patients have a condition called diabetes insipidus, um, very thirsty and unable to keep the water in the body, pee a lot. Um, and this is due to this hormone called AVP or desmopressin uh, deficiency. So that, if, if that's the only sign or symptom and no critical organ involvement, certainly we can treat with a hormone called the, the uh, ABP uh, replacement, nasal or tablets. Uh, in some patients with bone only disease with, uh, and that are painful, on occasions we may use radiation. Uh, certainly if it's uh, cutaneous lesions, rashes, what we call santalasma around the eyes, um, uh, dermatologists can be very helpful, laser surgery and so forth. Uh, for the most patients that we see, they have symptomatic uh, disease and one or more critical organ involvement, whether it's the brain, the heart, um, and so sometimes the lungs, et cetera. Then we have to uh, give a bit more aggressive therapy, uh, what we call systemic therapy, drugs that go uh, inside the body and go to all the organs. The treatment uh, is a bit, uh, there are choices of treatment, so everyone here probably has heard about the inhibitor therapy. So these are drugs that target certain mutations, whether it's a BRAP or non-BRAP inhibit uh, mutations. And then there's some other rare, more rare mutations, you know, what we call fusion proteins or uh, other mutations beyond the BRAP and also what we call the MAP kinase. Um, and on the right, right hand side here, the other systemic therapies, these are what we call the non-targeted agents, wherein these are 
uh, systemic treatments that we have used a lot actually prior to the discovery of the BRAP mutation. These are chemotherapy, immunotherapy drugs that can actually, uh, uh, is, is, is uh, what they call this mutation agnostic. So you can use it with any kind of uh, mutation. At least that's what we were doing before we knew about mutation. Um, the difference here is, you know, the, B, the mutation directed therapies, what we call the inhibitors, it, as long as you know the target and you have the right uh, treatment for that target, most patients will respond to the therapy. Um, but for the other systemic treatments here, the chemo immunotherapy, um, the response rate is much lower, maybe 30 to 40%. And as of now, we don't really know how do we select these patients. You have to try it on, say, for example, interferon or cladribine, uh, try it, and there's probably 30 to 40% chance of uh, uh, response. So I'm just gonna go, the next couple of slides will be, uh, uh, I'll be talking about some of the side effects of these treatments. The targeted agents are what we call inhibitors. There are two now at the approved, um, bimirafenib for BRAF mutations, cobimetinib for non-BRAF mutation, and also patients who uh, cannot tolerate bimirafenib. So these two drugs uh, are oral drugs, uh, Bemirafenib is also a Selborap trade name. Cobimetinib is Cotelic. They're both oral agents. Uh, there are some similar side effects. Fatigue is common, uh, rashes, acne. Unfortunately, it's common depending on the dose. Uh, loose stools, you can see that. Uh, joint aches or pains. For Cobimetinib, there is a small risk of heart failure, uh, some visual changes, what we call retinal. Uh, findings, uh, and therefore taking these drugs will require uh, a, a concerted effort, you know, with uh, multidisciplinary visits with, say, dermatology for the eyes, and also um, uh, what do you call it? ophthalmology, derm ophthalmology for the eyes and dermatology to manage the rashes. So there are other uh, BRAP and MEK inhibitors that are not FDA approved for Erdheim Chester disease, but they have been used for other cancers for many years. And you can see these names here. So sometimes we use those drugs, especially if there are um, you know, side effects uh, using the vimirapine or cobimetinib, and they may be able to tolerate the alternative inhibitors. So for chemotherapy, these are the uh, three most commonly used chemotherapy, cladribine, cytarabine, uh, methotrexate. Uh, the cladribine and cytarabine are given intravenously um, and um, fatigue uh, and infection. So chemotherapy, unlike the inhibitors, it lowers the, your immune system, lowers your blood counts, and therefore there's risk of infection. So there is that chance. I have to say it's not like overwhelming. You know, I would say maybe 10% or less of my patients may get some kind of infection with these chemotherapy. Majority do not. A methotrexate can be given orally or intravenously. The immunotherapy, uh, these are uh, kind of different forms of immunotherapy compared to the ones that you hear now for, uh, say, solid tumors. Uh, interferon has been around for many decades. Uh, the long-acting one is called PEG interferon. Uh, there, uh, the, there have been a, a lot of long-term uh, uh, reports on the success of using PEG interferon. However, the problem is, you know, people get uh, a lot of fatigue, flu-like symptoms, um, and uh, for sirolimus, um, this is also uh, an immunosuppressive agent used in transplant. For certain mutations, sirolimus may, uh, may, may help, like the mTOR uh, mutations in the mTOR pathway. Um, it's an oral agent. Uh, one of the problem here is the blood pressure and cholesterol can be raised or elevated in diarrhea. Um, and then uh, the rest would be uh, what we call anti-cytokine or anti-inflammatory um, uh, drugs. Um, these are used by rheumatologists for, say, rheumatoid arthritis, um, anakinra, kanakinumab, infliximab. These have been reported in case reports and a few case series. They can be effective in uh, reducing the side effects, such as if patients have fever, 
a lot of uh, joint swellings or inflammation. And nowadays we use this as, uh, as in support or uh, as an adjunct to the other systemic agents. Um, so this is the last slide that I, second to the last slide that I have, you know, so as far as kind of how do we manage our patients? And again, the answer is personalized. You know, we got to look at each patient, look at the signs and symptoms and how the patient tolerates the, with the, tolerate the treatment that, uh, that we give. So a lot of our patients I, I know in this room are on targeted agents. Um, as alluded to earlier, these are not curative drugs. It controls a disease and suppress uh, Erdheim chester disease, and you have to take it for long-term. Um, the other uh, option will be like, do it sequentially, okay? So give the targeted agents, which, is very, which are very effective. Once you get the response, can you consolidate, say, with chemotherapy? And certainly there are certain patients who are a candidate for this. The goal or the hope is can we actually not give them treatment forever? Maybe stop at some point, finite. Um, and then certainly there are some patients with minimal organ involvement on targeted agents, have a complete response by imaging. Can you hold or give them a break? you know, short break or even longer break or even stop it. And we know that most patients are not able to do this um, because the disease will recur, but certainly a small proportion may be able to do so. And then uh, chemotherapy, uh, we talked about, you know, if it works, a lot of the time you don't have to be on treatment forever. And then the last one is, you know, um, chemotherapy doesn't work for everybody. What if you give chemo first? And if it doesn't respond, then work with uh, what we call the targeted agents, but that will require long-term treatment. Um, finally, I just wanted to uh, thank my, our group here at the Mayo Clinic, uh, our uh, care center. These are all the providers, Mayo three sites, Minnesota, Florida, and Arizona. Uh, without them, I, um, you know, certainly I, can't, I won't be here on the stage today. Yeah, thanks a lot for the talk, very informative. Uh, one question, of the patients that are non-symptomatic, how many over time end up becoming symptomatic? Yeah, great question. Um, I don't know the exact answer, um, but certainly I would say, and there's a selection bias, you know, when they come to Mayo Clinic, a lot of them or most of them probably are symptomatic. Um, but let's just say one in six or so may not be symptomatic, one in five. If I see them over time, um, I, I would say probably half over time probably would develop symptoms. Um, it, it's, it's a rough estimate. Yeah. But certainly there are some patients that I have followed over 10 years who have not developed any symptoms and have not required therapy. Uh, Dr. Goh, thank you very much for your very comprehensive presentation. Oh, by the way, I'm Joel Hayashida. I'm a patient here with my long-suffering wife and caregiver, Susan Liu. Um, <clears throat> what I really liked was the fact that you have shown that there are many, many different treatments depending on where the patient is in the history or progress of his is or her illness. And I noticed that you didn't um, put up imatinib or Gleevec. Um, probably I, like a number of patients here, were started on that. And I'm not sure if there was sort of a bias early on that this particular drug was a fix-all for all patients. So again, I'd like your comments on that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Joel. Um, yeah, certainly I have to acknowledge that in the earlier reports, uh, especially before we knew about the BRAF and MAP kinase pathway mutations, uh, and certainly before any of these drugs were approved, um, there have been uh, attempts or trials of, of other targeted agents, including imatinib. And um, I actually just reviewed the literature not too long ago, um, but but certainly have seen those responses. And um, some of these other targeted agents uh, that are not that were not in the slides, they have a bit uh, broader. Uh, they inhibit more uh, targets, and certainly I think uh, and and we know uh, 
ECD and other histocytosis, they are not really a monotonous disease. They may sometimes have more than one pathway, even though they may have only one mutation, but may have more than one pathway activated. And certainly, I think for some patients, imatinib had worked in the past, uh, certainly not a treatment that we would bring up on the first day, uh, but certainly subsequent if, if we don't have other uh, mutations found or no other treatments that are, have been effective for these patients, that certainly can always circle back uh, to these uh, other treatments that have been shown uh, to be effective for certain patients. Yeah. Thank you, Joe. Yeah. Mm -hmm.